Hello everyone and welcome to the Young Rarer Lecture 2022. I'm uh, Victoria Burton, the Membership Administrator and Trustee of the Amateur Entomologist Society and I'm delighted to introduce uh, three extraordinary women scientists here today um, starting with uh, our Royal Entomological Society President, uh, Professor Helen Roy and uh, Amateur Entomology Society President uh, Bula Gardner, Garner, and our uh, speaker today, uh, Professor Camille Parmesan. And I'll hand over to uh, Helen Roy, first of all. Hi, thank you very much, Victoria. And it's just wonderful to be with you all today and also to be having an activity with the Amateur Entomological Society and the Royal Entomological Society working together and I think that it's so important that we collaborate and that we work together and that we share our enthusiasm and passion for insects in these kind of ways and it's just really very exciting for the Royal Entomological Society to be here um, alongside the Amateur Entomological Society so thank you very much for inviting us um, to be to be with you. I don't know if those in the audience have had an opportunity to um, visit our new Royal Entomological Society website but I'm really excited by the sparkliness um, that has been introduced into um, our online side of things so if you haven't had a look then please do take a look and um, we're always being delighted to hear from you um, whether it be through the Amateur Entomological Society or directly to us we'd be very pleased to hear from you but thank you very much to Beulah and to Victoria for inviting us to be here alongside you today. Thank you Helen, thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure as president of the Amateur Entomological Society to welcome you all to the 2022 Young Beryl Lecture. This is the second year we've had the honor of partnering with the Royal Entomological Society. And with that, we are very excited to introduce Professor Camille Parmesan, who will be giving this year's lecture. I'd also like to thank you all, all of you people tuning in today. And if you are not already a member of the Amateur Entomological Society, I do recommend you come and join us if you are interested in entomology, and frankly, who wouldn't be, or simply love to find out about the most important of all creatures on our planet. We have a website, um, so please do take a look at what our society has to offer, especially our wonderful bug club, which has all sorts of events and also a lovely magazine that comes out every so often. So uh, this version of the Beryl Lecture, aimed at our young audiences, so of course, open to all and everyone, aims to give um, some insights, not only into entomology, but also into wider uh, global issues affecting all of us today. Um, with that, we are very lucky to have the brilliant Camille speak with us today on the subject of climate change and how this is affecting insects globally. Camille uh, is currently the director of research of the CNRS uh, research station in experimental and theoretical ecology in France, though she also works collaboratively all over the world, including the UK. Um, her research focuses on the impacts of climate change on plants and animals specifically. She has received a number of accolades for her scientific work, far too many to mention here today, but importantly, including Outstanding Woman Working on Climate Change by the IUCN, that is the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, she is elected Fellow of the European Academy of Sciences, and of course, most importantly, is an honorary fellow of the Royal Entomological Society. Much of her work has focused on butterflies and their responses to a changing environment and climate, along with many research papers on the impact of climate change on insect pests, as well as on human populations. She is currently coordinating lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for their sixth assessment report this year, which many of you will have read about. And if you haven't, I do recommend that you are aware of it. Very important document on the state of our poor planet as it is today. But hopefully there is some hope and Camille will certainly be bringing some of that to her uh, talk today, us. 
So with that, it remains for me now to hand over to you, Camille. We're very excited for your lecture and sure there will be many interesting questions from our audience afterwards. Um, please do feel free audience to uh, put your questions in the chat and we'll address them at the, at the end of the talk. So it's my pleasure to introduce Camille. Thank you very much, Bula, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, just give me a minute while I share my screen and hope you can all see that. So as you heard, we've, I've just finished a re report with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it's been a five-year process. <laughs> it's really um, quite intensive. And I, uh, to give you a, a little bit more background, I was a professor at the University of Texas, and then I became a professor at the University of Plymouth in Britain, spent many years uh, happily in exploring around the South Coast Trail and, and Dartmoor, um, as well as other parts of, of the UK. And, but I was brought down to Southern France as part of President Macron's Make Our Planet Great Again program that was a response to President Trump pulling out of the Paris Accords, which is the international agreement on what governments should do about climate change. So the report that I just finished, it's, I'll, I'll just say it's very large um, and, and, and it did take yeah, five years in the making and I won't go into everything about it, but I do wanna show you just a few things uh, that we have, were able to come uh, to assess in, in our report. So one of the big things we're seeing is species moving towards the poles. So in Britain, moving northwards uh, and upwards in elevation and having earlier spring timing. So just a couple of examples, uh, the purple emperor invaded actually into Sweden and Finland. It was a new species for those countries. This happened about uh, 20 years ago and it's continued to colonize. See these errors are showing it's continued to move northward in both Sweden and Finland. So that's a good aspect of climate change. The uh, butterfly collectors in Sweden and Finland are quite delighted at having the purple emperor in their backyards now. We're also seeing species, tropical species moving up out of the tropics from Africa into Europe and from Mexico into my home state of Texas and into California and Arizona, all of those states along the border with Mexico. So we really are seeing rather mass movements of species when they have enough habitat and uh, are able to fly well enough, to disperse well enough to get to these new places, tracking the climate as it shifts around. We're also seeing that evolution is helping this. So we're seeing uh, the, the ability of, of uh, individuals to fly, to disperse is getting better in some of these colonized populations. And one of these is the map butterfly, beautiful little thing that again has moved into Finland, but as soon as it got into Finland, it very, very rapidly started expanding northward because it evolved uh, the ability to fly better than it used to be able to. So what is this effect in general having though? What we're seeing is that an awful lot of species actually are not able to move into these new areas because of large agricultural areas or large urban areas, or just they're not very good at, at dispersing around. So in general, what we're seeing are losses, and these are some projections for what we would, do. we're at 1.09 warming now. So this is the warming, this graph here is showing the warming we've already had. And here's where we're expected to go with doing a lot to reduce fossil fuel use and then not doing very much. And with this 1.09, we're already seeing a lot of changes around the world. And what this is showing is a map of where we might expect to see more changes in the near future at 1.5 warming, at um, two degrees, three degrees, and then four degrees warming, where we see quite a lot of areas losing more than 75% of their species. So we don't want to go there. We want to try to keep it to what we've already had or to 1.5, maybe two. We want to keep it in this area. 
So one of the insects that we're really concerned about are pollinators. Why? Well, a lot of crops depend on wild pollinators to pollinate that crop. So to get the fruits and nuts and vegetables that we're trying to get, about 20% of those require pollinators to pollinate them. And many of those pollinators are wild. So climate change is expected to reduce the effectiveness of pollinators, both because of these local losses of species and also because we're seeing shifts in timing with spring getting earlier, but not all species are responding the same. So if the pollinator gets out of sync with the flower that it pollinates, that can cause a problem. And then of course, climate change isn't the only thing going on. We're using too many pesticides. We're destroying a lot of the native breeding habitat. So wild bees might go into a crop to pollinate it, but they often need to have some natural habitat surrounding them in order to breed. And then we've also seen an increase in insects, um, uh, parasites of insects and diseases that we're not really actually sure we understand totally. So to give you an idea of one big group of pollinators are bumblebees, uh, and they're absolutely amazing uh, uh, to look at when you look at them closely. And the map on the left here is what you'd expect to happen to bumblebee richness if only climate change were happening. And the reds are where you expect declines and the blues are where you expect more species. So this is what I was talking about. You expect these cold areas in Sweden and Finland and Norway to have an increase in species. As species move up from the south, you get an absolute increase. And to some extent, we're seeing that with butterflies. The southern Sweden, southern Finland has more butterflies now than it had 100 years ago. And in the USA, uh, we expect increases throughout a lot of the uh, Midwest and West, uh, probably more related to changes in than to temperatures. But if you look at the map on the right, this is what's actually happened. So we are seeing increases in species richness of bumblebees in Scotland and in Sweden and Finland, but we're seeing a lot more declines than you would expect just from climate change. Even in these large areas of the USA where you would have expected there to be more species because of climate change, we're mostly seeing declines. And that is probably because of too much use of pesticide, loss of a lot of the habitats. These are very large agricultural areas and becoming more and more sterile. In other words, when my mother was growing up in Illinois on a farm, there used to be a lot of, uh, the ditches were kind of kept messy. The areas along the streams had a lot of shrubs and flowers. And so there were, even though you had agricultural fields, there were a lot of areas where native wildlife could exist. But now with more modernization, the farmers have tended to clean out the ditches and clean out the waterways. So you've had to hew and use more pesticide. So you've had a, a large loss in insect diversity in those areas. Now, butterflies are my personal love, um, and they're also actually fabulous climate change indicators because climate change has affected the ecology, the evolution, the extinction risk, but also we have a lot of information about butterflies and they can help us actually understand by watching how they coping with the climate change that's already happened, they can help us understand ways that we might help them to survive climate change. And this is just some of my team here. The main butterfly that I work on is Edith's checker spot that's on the left here. It's a very close relative of the marsh fritillary, the Euphydra serenia that lives in the UK. Now, Edith's checker spot lives in the western part of the, of the USA and, and into Canada, and it, but it lives everywhere. It lives from very low elevation to very high elevation, and in each place it eats a very different host plant, and it's very sedentary. It doesn't move very much. So what we see is this huge variation across its range in not only its ecology and evolution, but how it looks. So these are all the same species 
even though they look very, very different to us. And because of that, it makes it a really interesting species to study because it has all of these little, what we call ecotypes. They're doing different things in different places all the time. But to study them, there, there are wild species you have to go out into the field. So this is us going out into the field in California with our caravan. This is at the top of the Sierra Nevada uh, in Yosemite National Park. And this is one of our field sites where you can see we've set up on the left on the picnic table, our insect cages, and we have a lovely fire every night. It's, it's really a fantastic life cycle. And I should say, when I was an undergraduate in, in university, I was going to be a medical researcher, but I had to do an undergraduate research project as, as many of you uh, will probably do. And I chose to do it on this butterfly, this Edith's checker spot in California. I spent about a month up in the mountains, uh, living and camping out and, and working on it. At the end of the month, I actually had a paper and a, a publishable paper, uh, at least the data for a publishable paper. And I thought though, to heck with medical research, this is what I'm gonna do the rest of my life. And Edith's checker spot has told us a lot about the impacts of climate change. So what we've seen is populations go extinct. Ex when they go extinct, they go extinct from climate extremes like fires, drought, but it's happening all over the range. It's not just happening at the Southern edge. And we're seeing as the ground is getting very, very hot, they used to lay their eggs very low. Now they're laying their eggs higher, presumably to get away from the ground that's now getting too hot. We're also seeing that as they're colonizing these new areas, as I was saying, as species are colonizing into Sweden and Finland and, and into Scotland, uh, we're seeing that we get more genetic variation released. It was hidden, it was there, but it was hidden. And as they colonize, it sort of, you get this huge variety showing up that you didn't see before. And so that gives us hope that actually this species may be able to cope in ways we can't foresee right now. Now, other insects are causing a lot of problems. Many forest pests, moths and beetles are having much, much bigger outbreaks. Uh, this is a forest in British Columbia where it was such a large beetle outbreak that the forest, which normally it's a high carbon system, it normally is really good at removing carbon from the atmosphere and storing it in both wood and into the soil. But because of this huge beetle outbreak, it actually turned from being a carbon sink, so taking in more carbon than it put out, to being a carbon source. And this is a problem, uh, it's happening in other systems around the world. The other thing that's causing these systems to turn from being sinks to sources is fire. Uh, fire weather has increased, so drier, hotter, higher winds, uh, which are the conditions that create uh, are the ability to have a, a hot fire. Those conditions have gotten worse around the world. And we're seeing fires happening in weird areas like the, when the Yorkshire Moors burned in 2018, they don't normally do that. And at weird times of the year. So California normally has fires, it's a fire dependent system but it normally has them in July and August, which is the dry season. But fires now occur in California and other parts of the West during what are supposed to be the rainy seasons. So all of this has led to an increase in burned area that is directly due to climate change. Now in the UK, you also have very high carbon systems, but your high car highest carbon system is actually not the forest, it's your peatlands. And here's a map of where all these different peatlands are. It's only about 12% of the land in the UK, but it stores more carbon than all the forest of the UK, Germany, and France combined. But unfortunately, the peatlands are being damaged and the, the damaging of the peatlands, the drying out is causing the carbon that has been stored for hundreds to thousands of years in the soil is now decomposing and being released to the atmosphere. 
And it's actually responsible for a good chunk of, of the carbon emissions in the UK. And the peatlands, when it degrades, it not only is not as good for society because we really want it to be a, a carbon sto store, we want it to store the carbon, but it has this fabulous biodiversity that is associated only with uh, the bogs and the um, uh, wetlands of, of the peatlands. And there are some insects that you may not care as much about that are more common, but even these are important for the other wildlife that you do care about. And the drying of the peatlands is reducing the amount of these re food resources for many of the birds that are peatland specialists. Now, even in areas where trees are natural, like where I'm living now in France, this is actually my house. That's where I'm sitting right now. You can't see me, but it's where I'm sitting. And this area would naturally all be forced. But because humans have been around for more than, well, have been for, here for 30,000 years, but really have been intensively managing the land for at least 10,000 years, you know, planting crops, having domestic um, animals that they grow, because of all that, there's a whole ecosystem that's adapted to these managed grasslands. And if you were to allow them to revert to forest, you can see there's forest all around, a lot of species would go extinct. Farmers would lose their livelihoods because this is actually a working cattle farm um, as well as a hay meadow. And if you allowed that, France would then become go from being an exporter of food to having to import food. So when we, this is why I know probably you've heard about, oh, tree planting programs. Everyone should be planting trees to try to combat climate change. And sometimes that's absolutely the right thing to do. Trees can be good, but please do not plant trees everywhere. In an area that was naturally treeless, you don't want to be putting trees in and causing all of that wonderful biodiversity to, to, be, uh, to go extinct. And you can often do a lot of damage to what are called the services of that ecosystem, like its ability to remove and store carbon from the atmosphere. So tree planting can be good if it's done in the right place and in the right way, but don't do it everywhere. And for example, what this is showing is the, the incredibly diverse savannas in Africa with all of the rhinos and elephants and lions are, are grasslands with little clumps of trees. You don't want to be planting trees everywhere because you would lose all that absolutely fabulous wildlife. So what our report concluded is that the window of opportunity to keep global warming down is small, but there are still options. And one of the biggest options, the easiest, cheapest thing to recognize and, and to put energy into is that humans depend upon nature. Our ability to keep climate change under control depends upon nature, removing that carbon, putting it into storage, in the ground, into wood. And this is going to require about 30 to 50% of the land that's healthy. You just protect it, let it stay healthy. But it also means we need to think much more about humans living in cohabitation with nature. Instead of thinking about it as a competition, humans or nat nature, we need to be much more thinking about interdigitating our human development into the natural world. So what do I mean by that? Well, first, let your garden go wild. <laughs> let it go. This is uh, 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 Miriam Rothschild, and this is was her house when she was living there. She let it go absolutely wild. All these wonderful wildflowers that she would collect her seed, and then she'd sell the seed for the wildflowers. So messy is good. Messy is alive. And the have your garden, the this biodiversity yourself, but also helping to save the planet from climate change.
And keeping it messy is not just where your home is. So this is the South Coast Trail outside of Plymouth where, where I lived for many years. And notice that it is grazed. They, they bring in Dartmoor ponies to keep the shrubbery down, but they make sure it's very lightly done so that you still have this fabulous floral diversity. And this is the bush that I'm sitting at right here, just looking at it on a spring morning, just incredibly uh, fabulous butterfly diversity, nectaring on, on flowers there. Now we do need to produce food. So how do you do that and, and think about doing it with nature in mind? Well, here's an example from Africa uh, and it's called agroecological farming. So it's combining agriculture with ecological uh, methodology, ecological knowledge to produce something that is a lower impact on the landscape. And so part of it is allowing some native trees to grow. You can see that it's sort of more embedded in the natural landscape than these big industrial agricultural fields. You can probably also tell there's many different crops being grown, interdigitated. And this makes the food production system much more resilient to climate change. So the sort of increased heat waves, increased droughts, increased flooding that climate change is causing, if you've got just one crop, you can lose all of it with one of these extreme events. But if you have a bunch of crops, you'll tend to lose some of them, but not all of them. So you can keep your food productivity growing. Now, in Europe, a lot of agroecological farming is actually traditional farming, traditional uh, management of the land, having smaller plots interdigitated with trees as this vineyard in Austria has, but also in the UK, having bits of forest in between the farming farmed plots and having hedgerows surrounding them. And what was really amazing to me when I first came to the UK, was to realize that not only are the hedgerows fabulous for allowing these species to try to track climate as it's moving across the landscape, so helping them disperse and getting from one natural area to another natural area, but also the hedgerows themselves could be breeding habitat for many flowers and birds and, and the butterflies and, and other sorts of insects and bees. So it was a real eye-opener for me that you don't need enormous, I mean, when you have the luxury of having enormous, large, unprotected, healthy ecosystems, that's great. But when you have a high human population density, as the UK does, you can still retain a lot of native wildlife and, and flowers by just interdigitating the landscape uh, in a, in, a, in a smart way to allow that wildlife to exist. And as I said, to allow these movement corridors as species are trying to track a climate that's shifting across the landscape. In France, uh, uh, it's the same thing. Traditional management of the land is much more climate friendly than industrial management. This is a hay meadow. It is a working hay meadow and it has I think, as you can see, absolutely fabulous floral diversity uh, where they use the hay meadows for sheep or for cattle. They tend to do it in a very traditional manner. So the transhumance is there's the shepherd, his sheepdogs moving these. They're very dense bands of sheep, but they're moved through within a few minutes, right? So that the, this picture was taken within just a five minute window when they were in this spot and 10 minutes later they're out of the picture and that kind of traditional management then results in not only are you producing food but it retains this incredible floral diversity and this incredible butterfly diversity as well so this these photos here were taken from one of those areas that was very heavily grazed by sheep just a month before. This is my home in southern France. Uh, and it, as I said, it is a working cattle ranch. But notice there aren't very many here. They put them on at a very low density. And again, they move them around from farm to farm. 
And as soon as, as the grass starts getting a little bit um, low, they take them off. So they're never overgrazing. It's just a very light treatment, and yet it is a profitable cattle farm. It's not that it's uh, just done for management. And during the pandemic, my, our house uh, actually became our lab as well. Um, and we were rearing orange tips at the time. So having to bring them inside because our lab was closed down, we everyone had to leave within four hours notice. And one time we even got this little fellow come in by chance. It, it took us about 20 minutes to get him back out because he really, really thought he should be going out the window, which is not the right way to get out. And on our farm, the all the photos I'm going to show you, they're not necessarily the best, you know, professional photography, but I wanted to show that these were taken on our farm. All of these fabulous species and in the uh, far lower right corner, yes, that is a speckled wood. It is the same species as in Britain, but it just looks very, very different from what you're used to. And here's the map butterfly again and, and the swallowtail. And again, all of this was on our farm. Just absolutely incredible. I really enjoyed lockdown, I'll put it that way, because it gave us all this time to just wander around. Uh, this, the purple emperor is not a grassland species, but he wandered into our house at one point too. And fortunately we did get him out, but a lot of fun to have him around for some photos. And then of course we do have non-butterflies that are equally as beautiful and fabulous to look at. And of course this land uh, could also be used for renewable energies. So there's no reason to think that you have to be either windmills or farming or solar panels or farming and again if you do it in a smart way where you're thinking uh, holistically about the whole system not just about one or the other then you keep the grazing low so that you have a good floral diversity so that you keep the wild pollinators going so that then they can pollinate the crop that's nearby and you know in this case uh, farmers in hot areas are finding that if you put the solar panels up high enough, a lot of the animals will actually go under them in the middle of the day when it's too hot. They're not stupid. So there, it's a matter of thinking about everything you're trying to get this land to do and trying not to be too uh, narrowly focused about how you use the land. And of course, there are cities, very large cities. Uh, in, in just another couple of decades, some two-thirds of, of people around the planet are expected to be living in large urban areas. But even here, there's a lot you can do. I mean, this is a fabulous, huge apartment complex in Barcelona that they decided just to green up and to, to literally, it's, it's almost like a wall of greenery. And that's in the middle of Barcelona. Uh, Houston, my, my hometown, is doing a huge amount of greening up doing rooftop gardens, uh, as well as, as restoring natural riverways uh, to deal with increased flooding. So to deal with, they could, they were getting these huge storms in that would just flood the entire city became a lake. And so they're starting to create a city that absorbs the rain better, that has more storage for the rainwater rather than having it just run out um, across the landscape to deal with a very real problem. And the benefit is you then get uh, a cooler area, the plants help to cool, locally cool the air, and you can get some wildlife coming in as well. So especially if you're thinking about wildlife, thinking about insects, planting out flowers that are good nectar, this is a rooftop garden. Uh, you can even create housing. This is a bee hotel in the center of Paris. And it's quite a large, elaborate one, but you even putting just a little something on a tree in, in your back garden can really help to provide some breeding areas for many of the insects we want to retain. Another thing you can do is the way that we're able to tell that things are changing, that, that butterflies are moving northward, that butterflies are, and dragonflies are breeding earlier is because we have records. Many, many of those records are from amateur 
lepidopterist, amateur entomologist who are not professionals, but they go out every year, record what they see, when they see it, where they see it, and provide those records into central databases for people like me to then go in and look for these long-term changes over the last 50, 100, or even 500 years. Uh, some of these are called, the US has them. Uh, uh, this is for looking at changes in timing, phenological changes. The US has nature's notebook. Uh, the Woodland Trust has something called nature's calendar. You can easily become involved in this and just go out and record when you're seeing things um, and, and, um, and where you're seeing them happen as well. Uh, the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme has produced one of the absolute best databases in the entire world for looking at changes in butterflies on a very, very fine scale. And by doing all of these things, we can hopefully help keep diversity intact, even in the face of climate change, help it cope and help us understand what's happening. So all together, let's make our planet great again. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much, Camille. That was a great uh, look at uh, climate change and how it's affecting insects and uh, what we can do about it. We've had a few uh, questions come through in the chat and also in the thing in the uh, uh, Q&A box as well. Uh, you can still ask questions. Um, it's easier if you use the Q&A facility. It's in a little tab at the bottom called Q&A. This is easy to keep track of them there. Um, but I'm going to start off with a fun one. And uh, Camille, can you tell me what your favourite insect is? I think I might already know. <laughs> well, I, that's an easy one. Edith's checker spot is my baby. I mean, Edith's checker spot has been so good to me. Uh, it's taken me to beautiful places. It's produced wonderful scientific papers. And I would not have the career I have without Euphidris Edithus. So that's an easy one. I was also intrigued by your orange tip uh, butterflies there. What, what was it you were breeding them for? We're trying to look at, at the synchrony between the, the, uh, uh, between the butterfly and its host plant. Uh, and it, it actually eats several host plants down here. And it's, um, <laughs> it's been a bit frustrating because it's so very delicate compared to eat its checker spot. So I'm used to being able to, you know, pick up a butterfly and you put it there and you put it there. And with the orange tips, it's like you barely touch it and, and all its scales <laughs> fluff off. So it's been a lot harder to work with. Um, but we're still, we're, we're trying again this spring. So we'll see how it goes. And we've got a, a master student working on it who's very excited. Uh, so we're hoping in another year or so we'll have something out of that. But it's a it's a fascinating species because it lives, it has such a very tiny window where uh, when its host plants are edible because it only eats the growing buds. It doesn't it doesn't eat the leaves, uh, or if it does eat the leaves, it doesn't do very well. So it's got this even even compared to other butterflies, it has one of the smallest windows of time to fill out its life cycle. And so we were just like, well, climate change is changing these windows. So what's happening with the orange tip? Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, sticking with uh, butterflies, I uh, had a couple of people asking how they can make their garden a better habitat for butterflies. Oh, that is, it, especially in Britain, it is really so easy because the garden shops are so knowledgeable. So if you go in and you say, look, I want some nectar plants, and if this is where I live, this is so they'll know what the soil is because you can't grow everything everywhere. I want some nectar plants and I want some host plants. And so you want to be planting both. Sometimes it can be the same plant, right? But often certain plants are better for nectar and other plants are the host plants. You just start growing host plants and nectar plants in your garden, you will get the butterflies in. Mm -hmm. Unless okay. you're in a very... I guess there are some areas that are very agricultural. You might have to go bring the butterflies in, 
But in our garden, uh, actually in my mother-in-law's garden in off the south coast, she uh, had a, uh, her husband was from Austria and, you know, very Germanic. And while he was alive, he kept it totally, you know, mowed to like this high and, and everything in its own place. But when he passed away, we convinced her to let it go wild. And we would sort of encourage um, some of the host plants and, and we only let it be mowed, I think it was twice a year, maybe three times a year. And only when we knew nothing was happening in the, and, and it was fabulous. We got burnet moths breeding there. We got the, um, uh, the common blue breeding there. So we actually had butterfly populations breeding in her back garden simply by not cutting it or cutting it very infrequently and and after everything had already uh, gone through its life cycle so and 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 suddenly all these flowers were coming up that we didn't even know were there um but they had been you know put down to you know this much turf and you couldn't even see they were there until we stopped cutting so we didn't have to do any planting we didn't have to bring anything in all we did is change the mowing regime too. I think we cut it once in early June and then again in late September and otherwise left it go wild. And it was just wonderful. It was delightful. Yeah, it's great. You can just do a few little simple things to bring them in. Um, and I'm glad you mentioned the host plants as well. A lot of people forget all those uh, caterpillars, you know, and we moan about them, but you no, know, you don't get your butterflies unless you tolerate your caterpillars so you do good. need to let some of your plants get defoliated mm -hmm. yes and yeah. and i it's sometimes difficult but it's like it's okay the caterpillars need food too mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> okay um so a couple more um insect and climate change questions i think oh we've had one in the chat about uh oh they thank for a wonderful talk and ask if there's any information on how climate change is affecting insect vectors of disease, such as mosquitoes, um, ticks and things like that. Yes. Um, so I, 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 if you get a chance, I gave a talk on Wednesday that has more details and it actually does talk about disease vectors. Uh, so, yes, we are seeing vectors of disease moving northward and upward, uh, particularly in Nepal, in the Himalaya mountains. They have six new diseases uh, that have been brought in by mosquitoes and sand flies. And in the high Arctic, we're seeing new diseases coming in as the mosquitoes and the ticks and the worms <laughs> you know, move up. So yes, I mean, uh, at wild animals do carry diseases and yes, they are moving diseases around as well. Yes, it's not always uh, good news. Um, so we've got some other ones. Oh, so we've already given some nice information on butterflies. Uh, there's a more general one here on advice to young entomologists who wants to help save um, well butterflies, but also other insects as well. Is there anything else sort of other than letting your garden grow a bit wild or um, and making sure you've got the host plants and nectar plants? What other things don't put do? don't put pesticides out. Um, so I you know that sounds so. Uh, you know, because I've been talking about butterflies and bumblebees, and it sounds like I shouldn't have to say that. But what I found is somehow people have two brains. <laughs> they they love seeing the bumblebees and the butterflies, and you know, on their flowers. But then they get I don't know some moth outbreak that is destroying one of their trees, and they go and they spray all over it. It's like actually do you realize that you're now killing off everything else that that you want to be seeing and so i think just reminding people um you know to use either just let your plants be eaten i mean that's what we tend to do is we just watch them be eaten and they come back the next year um or you can physically remove you know if if there are are uh, moth caterpillars eating like you're growing a vegetable garden and you've got and caterpillars eating your vegetables you can physically pick them off i mean i i do that i i don't use pesticide on my vegetable garden i just go around with a bucket of soapy water and you know pick off what i don't want um and there's biocontrol methods you can encourage the ladybugs they're they're really good at getting rid of aphids um and so the the if you 
the less pesticide you use, the more you get natural predators being built up and, and the messier you keep your garden because natural predators tend to need a messy area, not, not, not have be all mown. Um, then you can start getting it under control in a more natural way. So yes, uh, and I'm very against Roundup as well because that, that just has so many bad effects especially on you know they it runs into your water rays and then it has you have problems with the freshwater species the amphibians etc so really trying to minimize trying to control nature i guess maybe is, is the way to put it and live with it great advice yeah thanks for that uh, okay well i had a lovely question in from matthias who's one of our uh, bug clubbers and he asks, uh, what is the biggest difference between the bugs you see in Houston and the ones you see in France now? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot more cockroaches in Houston. <laughs> That's an easy one too. Yeah, Houston uh, is basically, a lot of it is a drained swampland and, and you very much have um, swamp species still inhabiting it but it also you know it when i was growing up it wasn't as big as it is now and we actually did have a lot of um uh, uh you know lots that were just growing up in what was called weeds but actually it was you know native flowers and and so i grew up you know in a uh, with a lot of biodiversity around me uh the the it tended to be more these semi-tropical species. So a lot of the butterflies um, would just make it up to Houston. And then if we had a freeze, they'd be killed off. But so it, it's a, had just a lot more tropical feel than Europe has. Get luna moths and, oh, you know, wow. amazing half a dozen species of swallowtails. And so, yeah, really, really, really beautiful stuff. But nowadays the city has, it, it has some green areas. I mean, they haven't, they, and this is the trouble with developing with urban growth is in the sort of seventies and eighties, they just did massive, you know, laying concrete out and huge parking lots and big wide streets. And it's only recently that they've begun to realize that's why they have such big flooding problems. So there's been a lot of work to restore the bios, to allow them to flood, to restore wetlands. Um, and so it's it sort of went through a bad bit and now it's getting better. And I kind of see the same thing in a lot of other urban areas in Europe as well. They went through a phase of just everything being tiled and bricked and, you know, just you might have a little window box with geranium in it, but that was it to really, okay, where can we allow nature to, to, to exist? And that greening up of the cities is so incredibly important. As I said, not, not just to help keep wildlife going, but for our own health, it's, it's incredibly important to have greener cities. So it's a, we're going in the right direction. Well, that's good to hear. Okay, I'm moving on to some career questions now. I have one from um, Sophie, who is a university student in the UK, um, currently studying wildlife ecology and conservation, um, and would like to go into entomology. And they ask uh, what they suggest they look at during and after university. What, I'm sorry, I missed what, what do they look? Uh, so sort of um, tips for getting into, into entomology during their university studies and afterwards. Well, definitely you should get into doing research projects. So that when you go to look at university programs, make sure that they incorporate undergraduate research into the program so that it's, it's actually formalized that you will do whatever, six weeks or a semester or whatever on your own independent research project. That's what got me going. I did three different ones. I did one on honeybees, uh, working with one of the grad students he needed a lot of you know slave labor which is fine because i learned a lot and he got the data he needed to to produce his dissertation 
I did some work with um, kingfishers, the, the, the bird, <laughs> um, and realized I, I don't like getting up at four in the morning. And, <laughs> it's just, uh, and I worked with primates, actually, so I did four. And, and I found the primate work, I was interested in behavior, and I found it's uh, because of the animal rights issues, which are definitely necessary, it just wasn't possible to work with them in a natural enough setting. So, um, you know, and, and then I finally worked with butterflies. So that was my fourth undergraduate research project was on the butterflies in the mountains in California. And within, in, at one site in two weeks, I had enough data for a scientific publication, which I did publish as a single authorship. And, and that was before I had my undergraduate degree. So, I just went, okay, butterflies, that they're really good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I'd say play around, you know, I managed to do four in a four year undergraduate uh, degree. I managed to do four different research projects, um, which and if that variety, not only do you learn different techniques, but it's like, what do you actually enjoy getting your hands dirty with you know what what on a day-to-day -day level what is it that you enjoy the most doing and for me it was camping out in the mountains that was just like fabulous and the amount of data I was able to get from the butterflies was so much more than from the primates or the birds and even the honeybees were were more problematic so it was also a practical thing if I'm going to go on with my career this is how I'm going to be able to get my my research done and my publications out. Yeah, great. Thanks for advice there. Yeah, it's great if you can find an undergraduate degree with so much uh, research project. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't manage to do any original research in mine, but I did make up for it for doing a lot of volunteering in my spare time and taking part in citizen yeah. science projects and uh, making. Yes, yeah, certainly work. there's the citizen science projects, but but I think at this point that really should. I mean, you really should look for that when you're deciding what program to apply to. Um, because, I mean, citizen science projects are great if you have the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. generally, if you're a teenager, so I think that's great for teenagers. If you're trying to get your university degree, uh, it's, you know, you start getting kind of pressed for those weekends you're having to study and it's hard for you to get to go out. I mean, it's fabulous if, if you're so efficient and so smart that you can take weekends to do citizen science. That's great. But, um, but really, I, I had the most fun with the volunteer work when I was a teenager. And I did do a lot of volunteering with the Sierra Club and, and there was a group, uh, there's, in East Texas, there's a really fabulous nature reserve called the Big Thicket. It's swampland and uh, it's incredibly diverse. And I used to go out there on the weekends. And so, yeah, I did a lot of volunteering as a teenager, but as soon as I hit college, university, that's when I needed to really, you know, make sure my time was, you know, helping my career, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Um, I had a nice uh, batch of butterflies again, but uh, um, a good qu uh, question in the chat, which uh, Bueller's uh, put some comments on, but uh, but how people seem to prefer butterflies to moths. And uh, I, I've noticed that as well. Poor moths often end up getting just sort of, you know, little brown things that eat clothes and nothing else. So um, they're asking, how would you change people's mind about moths? Well, oh gosh, that's difficult. Moths are a lot harder to work with. So researchers often work on butterflies simply because they're easier to handle. You notice if you handle a moth, it, it also tends to fall apart. You have to, they're so delicate often, not all of them. But once you start looking into them, they're absolutely just as gorgeous and beautiful and diverse as butterflies are. It's just, you know, because a lot of them are night flying, people don't tend to see them unless they, you know, put up a light or do something to, to make sure they can. But I agree with you, moths are underappreciated. They're fabulous and they're a fabulous part of the diversity that, that keeps ecosystems going as well. So I, yes, <laughs> how do we have a campaign to appreciate moths? And even the little grubby, um, uh, uh, the 
the uh, winter moth, that's right, that uh -huh. eats oak trees. It doesn't even fly, right? And it looks so, well, the female doesn't fly. And when the male flies, it kind of is doing this and it's, it, you know, it's not what you'd call a pretty species. And yet scientifically, it's been absolutely fascinating to study. It's been studied since the 1960s and it's been a very important uh, species to look at, at these these detailed interactions between the insect and its host plant because again this is one of those systems where the timing the window is is this tiny little window when the oak just starts budding out that's when it's edible a few days later it's it, that leaf is too old and, and isn't edible and so these this the, the females do this wonderful bet hedging where they often lay a batch of eggs that are popping out at different times trying to catch that bud when it's just coming out so scientifically they're fascinating and yet you know if you were just going by are they pretty to look at mm -hmm. well eh, maybe not so but but they're great and we should appreciate them okay and um, so and um Sticking with the butterflies and moths, um, Timothy, um, it's another one of our bug covers, is asking uh, what sort of flowers should we grow in our gardens to attract butterflies? And I'm going to add moths to that as well, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, we want to try and get people into moths as well as butterflies. Yeah, well, that that's a difficult one because the, the valerian, which is the one I was showing you, is is fabulous for nectar, but it also tends to take over. So you've got to really have a heavy hand at keeping it um, confined, but it is fabulous for nectar. Um, other, I mean, just good old dandelion is, is wonderful for nectar. I mean, don't forget it. It can be a common species. It doesn't have to be something elaborate that you bring in from the garden shop. Um, a lot of uh, bushes are good for nectar. A lot of actually, some of the trees are really fabulous for bees. I mean, so not just thinking butterflies and moths, but also bees and hawk moths. Some of the floral, uh, very floral trees are very good for that. Um, so I'm spacing out because I've been in France for three years and I'm trying to remember what grows back in Britain. But, you know, honestly, in our garden, we didn't really, we got so much, as soon as we stopped mowing, there was this seed rain coming in from nearby fields and we really didn't have to plant much but you found as if you just stopped mowing and sort of started helping some things grow and keeping other things at bay like like the valerian really important for nectar but you had to be right on top of it or it would completely take over the yard so um and and this was you know in an agricultural area so I'm not sure you have to do too much planning in Britain. It's mm -hmm. more how you're managing your garden uh, rather than having to think really hard about what to bring in. Because I think almost all of the flowers that were just uh, volunteers, we didn't plant them, I'd, all of them were really visited either by bees or moths or butterflies. I honestly can't think of a single one wildflower that came in that wasn't used by someone. Yeah, and that's my experience too. I sometimes get more insects on the ones that just have appeared or I've been lazy <laughs> and let my cabbages go to seed and uh, get lots of insects on those rather than the ones that actually spent money on planting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just goes yeah. to show. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so we're coming up to five o'clock. I think I'm just going to end on one final question, if that's okay. Um, we had a ones asking, uh, what inspires you more? Is it the insects or the scientists? I, I would have to say it. What gets me excited about the science is working with the insects in the field. The science alone is not enough for me. I, I, you know, for some people, maybe it is. But for me, if I didn't have my time of actually being in outdoors with the wildlife, um, I wouldn't do what I'm doing. I don't think because the that I mean the science, especially with what I do, impacts of climate change. The scientific discoveries are often quite um, sobering. <laughs> um, you don't 
you know, you might be excited to get your paper in nature, but what you're saying is often a rather sad message. And so what keeps me going is getting back out into the field and seeing all that life around me. And it's like, okay, not everything is gone. <laughs> it's still here. I can still enjoy this. And I can still help get governments to appreciate that they need to support schemes to help the wildlife cope with climate change. So that's that's really where what keeps me motivated and going. That's lovely, yeah. Yeah, we all need a reminder of why we're doing what we're doing at times, don't we? Especially in these times. Yeah. yeah so, thank you very much for Kimmel for your talk and answering all those questions for us. And uh, thanks as well to Royal Entomological Society and Helen and uh, Eula from the AS and Fran in the background uh, doing the, the admin. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, Great. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Bye bye. Thank you all, lovely to be with you. Thank you all, hope you enjoyed it, bye-bye.